Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is Module 10, Politics and the Economy. Uh, so this will be divided up into a few lectures. The first one will be discussing uh, issues of power, violence, and authority, uh, which will set the stage for a discussion about uh, U.S. politics, and then we'll be discussing uh, economics uh, a little bit later. Um, so let's start with the idea of power and authority. Uh, so we talk about the idea, and we've discussed uh, as uh, clearly society is stratified, set up into layers. Uh, those at the top uh, are generally uh, have more uh, property power and prestige, but that also results in uh, what we sometimes call authority. Or you could also say, uh, when we looked in uh, Module 6, about uh, social controls, uh, again, the laws and rules that a society establishes to control behavior, uh, the reason that those uh, can be enforced is basically um, generally with either the threat or the use of violence to back those up. Again, physical uh, forcing other people to uh, do basically uh, what the rules are. So we sometimes ask ourselves then, uh, well, you know, where, from where does this authority derive? Uh, or what is the difference between what we call legitimate or illegitimate means of enforcing rules or using violence in a society. And typically that, that uh, uh, resides or is decided by uh, the definition of authority versus coercion. So authority is presented as the legitimate or justified use of violence within a society. So. Uh, if a society has laws and those laws are broken, uh, then typically also those laws within just this, the statement of what is and is not illegal or allowed behavior um, also comes with it the idea of how much violence the state is legitimately allowed to use in order to either prevent people from breaking those rules or to punish them if they have broken those rules. So uh, when we think about, again, and, and we often use the term authority and the authorities uh, to discuss what we generally consider to be legitimate or justified means of using violence uh, within society. So uh, if you are speeding down the highway at a you know, very high rate of speed and damaging property or endangering other people's lives, and the police attempt to pull you over and you resist and then they use what would be considered legitimate force to pull you over and then take you into custody, we would say that that use of force or violence is legitimized because the state says that that's what needed to happen. Um, of course, then there's lots of uh, different definitions of what is considered legitimate uh, use of force or uh, authorized use of violence. Uh, clearly in our society today, uh, there's a, 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 obviously a, a, a very large debate about how much violence is called for in various situations, and then of course we get into uh, lots of other uh, uh, definitions of, of social problems. Um, but that is different than the use of coercion. So a lot of times when we say uh, people's illegitimate use of violence to gain what they want, we generally call that illegal or coercive use of violence. So uh, for one person to threaten another person with a weapon or uh, to uh, act against that person in a way that, that breaks a law uh, is considered coercive use of force. So we have these very strict definitions uh, that decide when and where violence is appropriate, uh, appropriately used in society. So then we sometimes say then why do people accept the state or society's ability to use violence as legitimate? What makes us think that the state can use violence as a way of enforcing laws or uh, to maintain control or power uh, within society? And once again, we're turning to Max Weber, who uh, spoke a lot about this. Um, and he described several different types of authority that exist within societies uh, that help us determine why we legitimize use of violence in some places and not others. 
Uh, and the first type of authority he talked about was traditional authority. And by saying this, we kind of ask who's in charge or why can they do this when not everyone else can. And when we think about traditional authority, uh, you can kind of think about it as that's just the way it is or that's the way it's always been, again, traditional. So uh, if we want to look at it in a historical context, um, we discussed in an earlier uh, uh, module about uh, the divine right of kings. So if you were to ask, let's say, a peasant in medieval Europe, you know, why is the king the king and why can the king uh, you know, use violence to keep people in line or to uh, maintain his, or in the case of, of queens, her position in, in, uh, in power, the answer would just generally be, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. Uh, we accept that the king is the king, whether or not we were said for divine reasons, uh, because of pointing to um, you know, the, the uh, uh, legitimacy of uh, religious belief, or it's just, that's the way it is. Uh, when we think about it in modern terms, we tend to think maybe perhaps traditional definitions of authority don't exist, but actually, <clears throat> within a very important social institution, the family, we still see traditional authority being exercised. So for those of you who are parents, and for all of us who were children, we could probably remember a time when we disagreed with what our parents wanted us to do, or we as parents you know, are in a position to tell our children what to do, and of course the argument is, you know, why do I have to do that? Or you can't tell me what to do. And the answer given most often is, you know, you have to do it because I'm your parent and you have to listen to me because. And that is very much a, uh, an argument being made in the uh, favor of a traditional authority. So just kind of the way it's always been done or that's the reason why. Um, then Weber talked about rational legal authority. And this is the idea that within societies, especially more complex societies, uh, there are written rules of behavior, in other words, laws. So society takes codes of behavior and uh, rules about what's right and wrong to do and writes them down. And again, this is also one of his characteristics of a bureaucracy. Remember when we talked about bureaucracies, we talked about the idea of written rules and standards of behavior. So once again, this very much fits into Weber's uh, rational, and once again, the reason it's called rational legal is his rationalization of society uh, uh, viewpoint, whereas uh, the rules are written down, they apply to everybody equally. Um, in these situations, we also say that uh, it's the position the person occupies in society which is going to dictate their use of authority uh, and or violence. So a police officer, because of his or her position in authority, uh, can enforce laws. A politician, uh, because of his or her position, is in a position to make or create uh, laws. Uh, judges and other people can enforce the laws. So uh, not the individual characteristics of people, as we saw when we talked about uh, how society progresses away from rewarding people by merit, but much more for the position they occupy, also takes into account uh, their legitimate, or conversely illegitimate, but in most cases legitimate use of authority or violence uh, within a society. And again, within a rational legal uh, definition of authority, um, at least in theory, all the laws and all the rules apply to everyone in society equally. Again, different than a traditional uh, definition where, again, the laws would apply to other people but not necessarily the king, or laws in a family apply to some people but not necessarily parents. So parents can say that doesn't apply to me, I'm the parent, whereas in a rational legal system we at least, um, like I said in theory, make the assumption that all the laws in that society apply to everybody equally. And then the very last type of authority characterized by Weber is charismatic. And the idea behind uh, charismatic, and that again, comes from the root word charisma. And when someone has charisma, we basically say that they have a very strong personality, or it can also be extended to a person's message or what they're saying. Um, so a charismatic authority figure is a person who uh, 
has a very strong personality, personality traits or a message, and that is the reason that people follow them. So they may not have uh, authority in a traditional or a rational legal uh, definition of it, but um, people follow them because of who they are. So we can make examples of, uh, let's say, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, or Joan of Arc, or to a certain degree, uh, Martin Luther King. These are all people whose personality and messages were so powerful that people were willing to listen to them and follow them. So, um, again, sometimes there's a mix between uh, uh, these two types, uh, rational, legal, and charismatic, uh, when uh, we sometimes talk about the idea of, of a charismatic authority, we sometimes uh, talk about a cult of personality. Uh, that idea of, again, a very strong personality can cause people to want to listen to or follow an authority figure. Uh, and then we sometimes you hear discussions of people like uh, Joseph Stalin or uh, Adolf Hitler or uh, John F. Kennedy are often sometimes described as very charismatic leaders. However, those leaders clearly also fit a definition of a rational legal. Uh, clearly, John F. Kennedy was president and elected position. Uh, Stalin, again, a member of uh, the Communist Party and um, in, uh, in Soviet Union, uh, and a leader uh, elected into his position or appointed, certainly. And then Hitler, uh, Chancellor of Germany, and then later uh, appointed dictator. So these are still rational, legal, although those people clearly were known for their uh, personalities and messages. But the other examples I gave, Jesus of Nazareth, Joan of Arc, uh, Martin Luther King, these are people whose positions weren't necessarily uh, um, legal definitions in a rational legal sense, but it was their, it was their personality, their message uh, that made them uh, powerful and followed by so many people. Uh, one of the characteristics of a charismatic uh, type of authority that, that Weber found uh, to be a negative is that it's very difficult uh, to come up with what we sometimes call a transfer of authority. So in a rational legal sense, when people are either elected officials uh, and it's time for them to no longer be those people or they're out of the picture, uh, again, the authority transfers to the next person to follow that or to hold that position. So there is an orderly transfer of authority. So a judge who retires is going to be replaced by another judge who's going to have the exact same authority as the person who sat in that position uh, before him or her. The problem with charismatic leadership is once that leader no longer exists, it's sometimes very difficult to transfer the authority that they had. So we could say that when Joan of Arc was uh, denounced and then removed from her position, there was nobody to fill her position after that. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, it was, again, the, the uh, NAACP and the Civil Rights Movement, in a lot of ways, had a very difficult time finding another person with the same kind of charismatic qualities uh, to kind of step in and fill those shoes. When uh, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, uh, again, the Catholic Church had to resort, resort then uh, to a rational legal system of determining authority once the charismatic leader was, uh, was uh, not, no longer around. So again, Weber talks about those ways of defining uh, how and why do people accept uh, the use of uh, violence uh, and authority. And then we get to the idea of government. Uh, government is obviously structured uh, leadership within a society, and we can talk about kind of an evolution of uh, types as societies got bigger and bigger and started to evolve into what we call city-states. Uh, in which power became concentrated generally by those people who held the most amount of surplus uh, within a situation, uh, we saw the rise of monarchs. Okay? So these were people, obviously, uh, who uh, basically were in positions of power largely because of the creation of surplus in societies. And one of the characteristics of a monarch uh, is generally how, again, how the, uh, the power is handed down. So a monarch for the most part, hands their authority or passes on their authority uh, to uh, his or her children. And again, in many patriarchal societies, we imagine it's king to son, 
who then becomes king and passes that on. Uh, clearly, in, even in patriarchal societies, uh, it can occasionally be handed over to women, but generally what it does is follow hereditary bloodlines. Um, and this basically, as, as uh, monarchy started, and we saw the earliest ones generally taking place in pastoral horticultural societies, but then clearly as societies got larger and larger, especially uh, by the time we saw uh, societies transforming into agricultural societies, we had these established monarchies, okay, so in Egypt, pharaohs, and in Rome, emperors, and later on, kings and queens. Um, so we saw all these definitions of people who were at the top of society and their power was handed down uh, through, like I said, hereditary bloodlines. Um, again, when we talked about some of the upsets of uh, the modern age, one of the biggest transformations was away from monarchies uh, to democracies. In other words, power uh, by the people or power or government by the people. Uh, so we saw uh, clearly in the American and French revolutions, a uh, strong movement away from monarchies and toward democracies. Um, there's, we could talk about, uh, but uh, you know, just because uh, we, we kind of point to the American and French revolutions, that's not to say that there weren't democracies in history before that. Uh, clearly, a lot of the city-states of Greece practiced democracy, uh, and it was uh, considered uh, an invention of the, of the ancient Greeks. Um, even in the uh, uh, North America, pre-colonization, um, uh, the Iroquois Indians were quite well known for uh, engaging in uh, democratic uh, government. So in smaller societies, it was tended to be what we call direct democracy. So in other words, you could get a group of people together and ask everyone their opinions, and generally it was uh, one way or another, people expressed their opinions, and the majority then Rules, so the decisions were made, so each member could cast a vote uh, in one way or another, uh, and uh, that's called the direct democracy. Clearly, as societies get larger and larger and larger, it's difficult to get people together on a regular basis or uh, in, a, in a convenient way. Uh, so, a lot of democracies then become what we call representative democracies. So, as populations and territories grow, uh, local areas, municipalities, then elect officials, and then send them to a centralized location to participate in democracy. So clearly that's the type of government we talk about today, where we elect uh, representatives and senators and send them to uh, a centralized location, clearly Washington, D.C., um, to uh, vote on our behalf or as representatives of us. Uh, one of the things that came about because of democracies was uh, the definition or uh, principles of what we call citizenship. Uh, that is the idea that people within uh, these societies um, are given rights at birth and that uh, the government then is responsible not only for protecting the rights that these individuals are given, but that these individuals then have a, uh, a, a responsibility then to contribute to the society as a whole. So with the, the citizenship comes privileges and obligations. Uh, and this, of course, sometimes when we talk about uh, in this module a little bit later about globalization, is sometimes uh, we, we sometimes discuss then the idea of universal citizenship, uh, whether or not there should be uh, the idea of citizenship, which is guaranteed for all human beings on the planet, uh, much the way that individuals are guaranteed citizenship by uh, their nationality. Uh, the very last type of government that we can discuss, uh, again, this is, uh, there's many more uh, examples throughout history that we can talk about, but these are just kind of an overview, um, are the idea of dictatorships or oligarchies. Typically, uh, this is not quite monarchies, not quite democracies. Uh, they can come out of each. Uh, typically, when we look at the modern age and we look at dictatorships, those are generally uh, when we talk about, again, people like uh, Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union or Adolf Hitler in, uh, in uh, Germany in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, these were people uh, who came to power in democracies, but then uh, basically power was concentrated in uh, the hands of one individual, a dictator, 
or the, the other term that is up here is oligarchies. Um, again, uh, ruled by a very small group within a society. Uh, in the Soviet Union, you could actually say that the, uh, the Central Committee um, was an oligarchy ruled by a very small group of people who controlled the rest of society. Um, and again, both of these dictatorships and oligarchies are very much associated with uh, totalitarianism, uh, that idea of uh, an almost a complete control of a state of the citizens within that society. 